It's episode 167 of the Security Weekly News. Welcome to the week of 14 November 2021. The eyes do not lie. The FBI, Intel, Microsoft, Pom Pom Purin, Smishing and Ransomware Consulting. All this in the amazing Aaron Leyland on the Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. All right, I'm Doug White, and it's the Security Weekly News. Well, the FBI got hacked. Uh, Yep, on Monday, the FBI admitted that someone exploited an FBI messaging system configuration, that's how they put it, which allowed a hacker to send out urgent warnings. Uh, And the urgent warnings were about an imminent cyber attack. So they sent all these things out. The FBI announced that while the messages were coming from the LEAP portal, which if you don't know what that is, it stands for Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal. So that's like a big collective thing that a lot of people can log into, uh, that the emails themselves were fake. Uh, Brian Krebs apparently got an email uh, from the same server that had the FBI headers and everything on it that said, Hi, it's Pom Pom Purin. And it's a quote. Hi, it's Pom Pom Purin. Check the headers of this email. It's actually coming from the FBI server. I'm contacting you today because we located a botnet being hosted on your forehead. Please take immediate action. Thanks. Uh, Spam House reported that the fake emails were sent to addresses in the Aaron database. Uh, so they just probably scraped a bunch of email addresses and they sent out two separate gushes that their word, not mine, and not the word I would choose there. I was thinking more like spurts, but that's okay. You, you pick your words. I'll pick mine. Uh, about 100,000 emails were gushed out in total. And the, the FBI did say that the attacker did not get any data or any personal information in the attack and said that the issue had been resolved. Pom Pom Purin's Twitter account says, I am not a white hat. Don't follow me if you expect those types of tweets. Uh, the article goes on then asking about the purpose of the attack and all this, you know, like, why was this done? It doesn't make any sense. But it, to me, it just sounded like a good old-fashioned hack. I mean, it was just like old-school stuff. The purpose of the hack was I, because I could. I mean, this was a case where somebody found a hole, they exploited it, and they went in and did so. And then did they do anything dramatic with it? No, they just, just to prove they did it, they went out and they sent notices here and there. It does underscore how damaging these things can be, though. And as we rely more and more on the good old interweb for everything, you know, there's no more Walter Cronkite or Roger Simone to say, remain calm, and everybody turned off the TV and went to bed. Yeah, those are old news people. Yes, I'm old. Yes, I remember both of them. And yes, Roger Simone would have been saying that in Flemish. And yes, I saw him broadcast live from his house. But do you kids stop touching the magazines? You make the pages stick together. So move on. Um, Intel disclosed two vulnerabilities which can allow attackers to escalate privileges on a device. Sentinel-1, who actually discovered the two, these two flaws, CVE-157 and 158, uh, reported them, and then I guess Intel disclosed it after that. The vulnerabilities affect a large number of processor families uh, over a long period of time. and included like 11 gens, 10 gens, Xeons, Celerons, Pentium Silver. I mean, there's a big table in there that showed all these different things. They have not released a lot of details on the flaws themselves, but Intel did say, and, and this is one of those like, thanks guys for all your help. Intel basically said, patch your BIOS. Well, good luck with that. Uh, I mean, if your motherboard manufacturer doesn't release a BIOS update, uh, and if they or if they're you know haven't done it yet, or they may never do it, if you're running older processors on older motherboards, well, that's it for you then. Sentinel One said that the flaws are local privilege escalation type vulnerabilities or LPEs, which will allow users to become 
a system inner system management mode. And SMM code is kind of like getting into debug mode in a game or any other kind of application. And it typically runs in its own space and memory and is isolated from everything else. And so getting there is kind of like, you know, finding uh, the cavern of the winds and the Holy Grail or something. It's not something that's that easy to do. I mean, based on what I was reading there, it looked like it was a lot of steps and you sort of had to work your way up to that SMM situation. But it could do that. And if they could do that, they can basically control the machine at the BIOS level, which is really, really bad, uh, to use the technical term. Intel also released a vulnerability that may affect laptops and cars. Uh, po again, positive technology discovered this one. And it, what this one does, it allows the attacker to extract encryption keys from protected space on the processor, which if you can do that, you can generate all sorts of different kinds of attacks. Again, they didn't have a lot of details on how this actually worked. But the vulnerability is once again found in multiple processors, uh, and but one of them that it is in is Intel Atom E3900, which is what they use in the Tesla Model 3. So, you know, Elon, when you send me a Tesla, send me a Model X, please, because the three, I, no, I'm going to pass. But again, they recommend Intel with that, we recommend a BIOS update from your vendor. Uh, please contact them and don't call us. Thank you very much. Uh, so hopefully the vendors will get right on that. Loss of encryption information from protected space would allow you to put spyware on the chip. It could do all kinds of things. And of course, that can lead to supply chain attacks and other compromise. Yeah. Since we're all in doom and destruction today, here's another one. Microsoft released an out-of-band update to address authentication failures related to Kerberos, which would impact domain controllers. Uh, Kerberos, which has been around forever, is a ticketing system that they use to validate trusted machines or trusted users within the domain. So it issues these, these Kerberos uh, hashes tickets to you, and that authenticates you. So that's the trust. Uh, the flaw basically creates a situation where end users can't do much of anything than using a single sign-on feature in Active Directory uh, or Azure Active Directory. So it could basically lock everybody out uh, and or prevent them from getting to resources they wanted to get to. The vulnerabilities found in Win Server 2019 all the way back to Win Server 20 2008. So I don't know if that means, you know, maybe they just assume nobody's using Windows Server 2003 or maybe they changed something there. The issue is apparently the result of a November 9th security update on the domain controllers. This update is out of band, which in Microsoft terms means you'll have to go to Microsoft, find the right update, don't get the wrong one, download it and install it. Uh, errors reported by Microsoft included an Event 18 Kerberos Key Distribution Center event and several other fingerprinting type errors that are all listed in this article. So if, you are in, if you're concerned about that, you should check it out. There are about 7 million records available for sale on the dark web representing customer information for Robinhood customers. Uh, last week we reported that Robinhood had indicated they had had a data breach. Uh, which was via an employee account. Well, this week, uh, they actually found the data is indeed for sale. The data set includes 5 million email addresses, meh, 2 million full names, meh, 300 names with date of birth and zip code, eh, okay, maybe, and 10 people who had more extensive information taken. They didn't say what that extensive information was, but I'm guessing it might be their hat sizes or something. So I guess it's not that bad of a breach, really, unless you're one of those 10 people that lost your hat size. Honestly, I might not even mention this story, but there's a twist. Oh, yes, there's a twist to the story. Like an M. Night Shyamalan type of twist. You know, the one where that clown painting in your room as a child that turned out to be a secret window into some sort of clown hell, and so you climbed into the painting of your great-grandparents and ended up in Bittenberg in the 19th century kind of things? Yeah, that kind of twist. None of that really happened. I, I did have a scary picture of my great-great-grandparents or something that was, yeah, we won't get into that. I'll, I'll take that up with my therapist. But, you know, anyway, um, the twist is guess who stole the records? Pom Pom Purin! Here he is again. Good old Pom Pom Purin. Uh, I mean, right there. Anyway, Pom Pom Purin said that the records were going to be sold for at least five figures, which would mean, I guess, $10,000 or 10,000 euros, 10,000 zwoties. I, I don't know. They did, didn't say. But, it does, it, but that only is the email and full names. Uh, Pom Pom Purin said they were not selling the 300 records or the more extensive data of those 10 people. And Pom Pom Purin did say to Bleeping Computer that they tricked an employee into installing remote access software on their machine. So, you know, 
high profile there. The article has more details on the conversation that Bleeping Computer had with Pom Pom Purin. Uh, but I do think Pom Pom Purin, which I'm having fun saying, is going to turn out to have been dead all along and is just hacking from beyond the grave. Yeah, Johnny, get out. The hack's coming from inside the studio. Inside the studio! Yeah, sorry. I guess Halloween's over, but, you know, there was a little bit of a late Halloween story. So, you know, Pom Pom Purin. Um, anyway... Uh, Krebs had a story about smishing, which I wanted to mention. Uh, I do get these a lot on my phone, and I, I've had other people ask me about them, and I'm sure you've gotten them. You might want to issue a warning, though, to your users about it. Smishing is the use of SMS texting to do basically the same thing that they did with stone tablets in the Sumerian Empire. And then, you know, they did it with snail mail, phones, emails, texts, whatever. Whatever the next thing is, they'll be doing it with that. Uh, you know, so... TikToks, I guess, but which is basically they get you to click on a link with a warning in it. I mean, so nothing new there. Uh, the ones I've been getting have a lot of scary sounding stuff about charges to my credit card of like four. I, the last one I got said $4,800 and immediately said, you need to call this number to refuse the charge or click this link to, to contact us because we're going to approve it. Uh, I did just get one that said my Amazon account had approved the sale uh of something to me that was going to be charged in several payments of $4,800 each time, and I need to go here to cancel or I would be obligated to make the six payments. Uh, they're scary. I mean, you get that pop-up, you go, wow, is this something real? Did somebody hack my Amazon? Did somebody actually use my credit card number? I don't know. Uh, you know, and anytime you have a new, the reason I bring it up is because when there are new media sources like this, like, like SMS, which I know it's not new, but it's, you know, a lot of people especially older people starting to use SMS messages or having to use them for multi-factor and so forth, all of a sudden they get really scared with it. So a lot of people do fall for these kind of scams, and it's, it's up to us to get the word out. Uh, the one in the story says they were asked to approve or decline a $5,000 payment, so they didn't give them that, you know, you don't have to do anything. They actually said, we want you to approve this or decline it, like the kind of things you get when you make large dollar charges to your card. So I, get, I do get those legitimate if I make really big charges. Uh, when the person clicked no to decline the payment, they immediately got a call from J.P. Morgan Bank, which was who the message was supposedly from, that said it was the fraud department of the bank, and they needed to verify that the person they were talking with was not the scammer. I literally did this all the time back in the 1980s. We at the, at the bank, we would call people and say, someone's hacking the system, we need to make sure it's not you, that, that they're using your, your credentials, so I need to validate your password. And I would get people to give up their passwords all the time. So let's try to keep people vigilant on this because they're going to get taken in by these smishing scams. I could not re resist this story about the creation of security organizations to assist with the negotiation of ransoms. I wish I'd thought of it. I, I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, in, in a presentation at Black Hat Europe, a cybersecurity analyst at Foxit did a talk about ransomware negotiations, and, and, and they had analyzed 700 different negotiations that occurred between 2019 and 2020 to look at the data of how these things were handled and how much was actually paid out, but the focus was not on how much was requested, but how much they actually paid. So kind of like those analysis of new car purchase prices and consumer reports where, you know, you got people like my dad who just walked in and said, give me a new Buick, Lester. And they, they wrapped him up and he paid, you know, full sticker price. Uh, you know, whereas other people were like, I'm not paying that. I'm going to pay below the sticker and all that kind of stuff. So the talk was really academic type of analysis of the data. And they looked at how the attackers priced their ransoms and how they targeted people. And they were trying to actually come up with a predictive model to tell you how much to pay. And then they went on to set, provide a set of tips that said things like, be kind and respectful in the negotiation. Ask for more time. Offer a smaller payment quickly instead of waiting while more money is approved. And, I mean, none of that's bad. I mean, they were really good strategies, and they made a lot of sense, and they probably have similar things for, like, kidnappings and things. But one case they, they reviewed said that the initial ransom of $30 million was negotiated down to 500000 so I'm guessing whoever did that negotiation is probably a really big shot ransomware negotiator now. So I think the industry of ransomware has gotten so big that it's really going to start generating consulting companies who specialize in conducting these kind of negotiations, you know, with their own billboards and stuff like ransom, call Hanscom. What the hell rhymes with ransom anyway? I don't know. Hurt, call Bert. You have to have the right name though to do this. I mean, neither of my name works at all, which is how that whole white power thing happened. But 
I mean, anyway, I can really see a whole industry around this assisting and ransom payment, and I guess it's cheaper than fixing all the holes in the first place, right? Got mugged? Call Doug. Yeah, that might work. I don't know. All right. When he worked at Chippendales, he went by the name Thunderbuns, and his workout video, Clinch Thrust Release, sold millions of copies worldwide. He is none other than the most amazing Aaron Leyland live and at you from the sunny Isle of Britain. Uh, thank you, Dr. Doug, for always making me look like the um, less funny and less intelligent one and less beautiful as well. But we move on um, to the metaverse, metaverse, metaverse. So I can't beat Doug's intro, but today I am Meta, AJ Meta, 1969, formerly known as Aaron Leyland from Restricted Access. I did not want to come to you today as Meta, AJ Meta, 1969, but Meta, AJ, Meta, AJ, 69, and Meta, AJ, Meta, 69 were already taken. So here I am. <laughs> I can't even say Meta, AJ, Meta, 1969 anymore. So we're going to start with the Merriam-Webster Dictionary from back as early as 1928, believe it or not. Not that I was... Um, <laughs> uh, I just uh, got a joke going right in my head about um, none of you believing that I um, read a dictionary, and especially not one as old as 1928. But the name did not come from 1928, but in the dictionary, the current meaning generally refers to the concept of a highly immersive virtual world where people gather to socialize, play, and work. And then we move on to Wikipedia and all its glory. And thank you for your contribution to my master's this far, Wikipedia. And also thank you to all them people who answer the quests from Wikipedia for hard earned fiat cash to keep it at the forefront of all known knowledge. So Wikipedia states that the metaverse is a hypo, I can't even say this word today anymore, hypothesized iteration of the internet supporting persistent online 3d virtual environments through conventional personal computing as well as virtual and augmented reality headsets metaverses in some limited form are already present on platforms like vr chat or platforms like second life and did you know that Second Life, I'd never even heard of it, has circa 200,000 users per day, although like Ashley Madison, I'm not sure how many, if of course any, are stripper bots who live near you now and are very excited to see you, very, very excited to see you, and obviously bored and waiting right now for your call. But I move on to the origins of Metaverse and how it came about. And we can give credit to Neil Stevenson. He coined the term and established a vision of computer generated universe in his 1992 novel, Snow Crash. In the lingo, this imaginary place is known as Metaverse. Hero spends a lot of time in the Metaverse good for hero or hero. It is stated that meta here effectively conveys the idea of transcending reality permanently where Dr. Doug is. And that's as in metaphysics where Dr. Doug also is. And the more current use of meta as an adjective meaning self-referential or knowingly distinct from conventional and concrete world where I live. Okay, wisers. Um, in his video last month, the Zuckerberg says that meta comes from the Greek word for beyond, and apparently that's basically correct, and they go on the entomology, meta meant after in Greek, so metaverse also neatly implies a world or conception that requires the real world in order to move beyond it and acknowledge another realm. 
realm even it's all getting a bit weird okay back to my somewhat professional commentary back in the day when digital photo frames were the must-have tech addition to living rooms up and down the countries they became a badge of living in social housing the projects the ghetto although they have appeared to drift away even from the poorest of households we move on the rich appear to become less connected and the poor us um, become more connected. So in the olden days, when Dr. Doug was young and possibly in the Wild West, the poor had horses, and now only really the rich ride horses. Which brings me, and I don't know why this brings me, but there's a segue there somewhere to who actually eats fuel. And is it like starting smoking? Do you pretend that you like it more than traditional food? You really need that big push away from one of the great pleasures of life to take you to having somewhat dull in comparison. Shake, I move on. Okay, so as the rich are jetting off to idyllic places, obviously G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, at least that's where I would go if we could ever get out of this pandemic and travel would open up like it did before. And of course, if my cryptocurrency should ever take off, rather than giving me enormous feeling of disbelief like it is doing today, thank you, POTUS, for your press release today on cryptocurrency transactions over $10,000. That is really helping me to stay poor. Anyway, back to the narrative. So while the poor, that's what I was getting to, are at best in AR augmented reality, and at worst, absorbed into VR, virtual reality, where they will be fine 24-7, 365, having fuel or many of the so-called cheaper alternatives slowly pumped into their unrecognizable bodies, which are stored in rows in cattle sheds, akin to the field trade in France. I promise you I'm bringing it all together somewhat. Why run around on a tennis court or football field when you can do it from a paddle shed, shrouded it in the dark where you no longer hide behind filters and no longer have to stay away from visually touched up body shamers on the internet? Why do you go to a concert when you have full sense experience, when you can do it sat on your derriere? Why do it in real life when you can be catfished but convince yourself that you're happy about it? Anyway, I mostly had a pandemic of living off wine, Deliveroo, and completing Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Disney Plus. I kid you not, I did intersperse this with some writing, some learning, and some reading, of course, to pay for my new metaverse name. I did some working. Anyway, so a friend last week drove two hours for the romantic feeling of watching a movie from their car, akin to 1950s America, only to find we don't actually live in 1950s America. We are not even in America. And I'm reporting to you from London, England, although I wish I was there in the great old US of A. I have a romantic feeling of dirty fries, hot dogs, delivered via roller boots, not in a miserable car park in Milton Keynes. Don't bother Googling Milton Keynes. It's only mostly famous for that quaintest of English things, the roundabout. Anyway, so Milton Keynes with drug needles on the ground and an overwhelming stench of poverty. I move on. I feel the metaverse will be more like the latter than the former. Okay, so I have mentioned that metaverse first appeared in Neil Stevenson's novel, Snow Crash. We're blaming you, Neil, for this in 1992. But pulling myself away from the boomer Gen X commentary, which I'm giving you now for a second, it was recently staged in the movie Ready Player One. Okay, so to his friends, the founder of Facebook, explained that the metaverse is, and we obviously care what the Zuckberger says, 
an online world that provides a space for people to hang, work, and learn. It's accessible through a VR device, which I'm sure they will provide you for a cost, but that offers users an immersive experience. He said, over time, I hope we are seen as a metaverse company. Does that mean I hope we are seen as a metaverse company and not the evil Facebook that might do things with your data that you don't want you to do them in Cambridge Analytics. Anyway, 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 anyway. And um, I want to anchor our work and our identity on what we're building towards. Cheers, Zook. So commentators on the Zook Burger to his friends have since labeled that Facebook's metaverse plans are dystopian and a bad idea. No shizzle, Sherlock. Anyway, Facebook's evil. I agree. Please hope I never have to go for a job at Facebook. I don't think I'm going to get it. Anyway, Meta, as Facebook is now known, is investing billions in projects, in their project, I guess. This is obviously all happening while Elon Musk and the UN food aid chief have a very public spat over solving world hunger and saving millions of lives. Roger McNamee, great name, told the BBC, it's a bad idea and the fact we are all sitting, we're not, we're not, we're not, and looking at this like it's normal should be alarming everyone. It is, it is, it is. Meta's chief product officer, Chris Chris Cox, another great name, it's like I made these all up today, told attendees at the Web Summit in Lisbon that the idea would make the internet less flat. Okay. He said it would be considerably better than video conferencing. Yes, and so it's real life, but we go on as a space for meeting. However, speaking at the same event, which actually kind of makes this whole story kind of interesting, was that I can imagine them staring at each other over a slice of lukewarm pizza. But anyway, Mr. McNamee, wonder was he the one that tried to name Bodie McBookface, but I'm not sure that story made America. But anyway, Mr. McNamee, that's so great to say. We, great words on the show tonight. Was highly sceptical. Sceptical even. Facebook should not be allowed to create a dystopian metaverse, he said. Good for you. Okay, why should the metaverse concern me? I hope that that's what I hear you ask. And I can't hear you, so I'm going to continue. It is unclear whether there will be one metaverse or many different separate metaverses or any metaverse at all, really. But this seems to be the one constant. The metaverse is an immersive next generation version of the Internet, like rendered by virtual or augmented reality technology. The venture capitalist Matthew Ball, who's writing on the metaverse, has apparently influenced Mark Zuckerberg, um, described the metaverse as a successor state to the mobile internet and a platform for human leisure, labor, and existence at large. Okay, if there's any Freemasons or Stonemasons in the room, you may get the leisure labor. <laughs> Um, quote. Anyway, dare I mention Web 3.0 and non fungible tokens? I guess I'll give you half. I am going to read you some extracts from a great article in Quartz today. Okay, meet your digital twin, Mirror World. Uh, Mirror World is a digitally rendered version of the real world where there are virtual counterparts of real life people, places, and things. Mirror worlds are often found in sci-fi, including Netflix's Stranger Things, very good, Matrix films, very good, and the novel and film Ready Player One. The metaverse could be a mirror world designed to precisely reflect the physical world or could resemble an entirely invented world one might encounter in a video game, somewhat like my very first immersive Rick and Morty dream this week. Don't ask. Okay, skeuomorphic design. 
The wonky term essentially means that virtual objects will be made to closely resemble real world ones. The metaverse could resemble the physical world in that it will often appear tethered to the physics and designs of our reality, but it doesn't have to be identical. But digital twins, a digital twin is a virtual version of a real life object or structure and that term was first introduced in the 1991 book Mirror Worlds by David Gelinter. Digital twin technology was first used by NASA to run simulations of space capsules way back in 2010. Microsoft in particular has emphasized the need for digital twin technology in building the metaverse. A name that will all be familiar to us because there was a lovely movie about it way back when, when CGI just got good. Um, Avatar, and Avatar is your persona in a digital virtual world. This is digital rendering of your appearance. It may look like you, probably not. Resemble a cartoon as popularized by Snapchat's Bitmoji and Apple's Memoji or appear as fantastical as Fortnite skins, which I believe are pretty fantastical. Okay, what's the difference between VR and AR in this? What some of you are at? Is that what some of you are asking me? Probably not, because you're all really smart. But I know my mom's listening tonight and she will win to know. So we're going to go through it. Virtual reality is a VR is an immersive experience where one puts on a headset and sees and can operate within a digital world. VR currently uses full headsets rather than glasses, immersing the user in a 360 virtual world that they can move around in, apparently as long as they don't bump into walls. Augmented reality, AR, is a digital overlay projected on a real world. Think of Pokemon Go, Snapchat, Snapchat's dancing hot dog, been dragging me insane all day, or even wearables like Google Glass. Obviously, why Google Glass never took off, we could soon be peering through AR-connected glasses like Facebook to Ray-Ban stories, which I seen somebody wearing the other day for the first time, or Snapchat spectacles, which I have no idea what they are. Mixed reality, mixed reality incorporates elements of VR and AR, but the definition is murky. Um, a person can interact with virtual and real world objects, and virtual objects can interact with real world ones. For example, they're back again. I wanted to call it him, but I can't sex that dog. The Snapchat hot dog can dance across the table without falling off edges, unlike Dr. Dog or me in Vegas. If anybody has the displeasure to ever see me there, at the cat and Defcon. Anyway, has anybody seen this hot dog? I guess I need to hit up one of them millennium type people to get the lowdown on that. Nearly done. Extended reality. Extended reality is a catch-all term for VR, AR, and AR. That's all you're getting there. Anyway, nearly back. Massively multiplayer online role-playing game. MMORPGs. They're interactive games that form the basis of what many feel will be the metaverse with millions of people interacting in shared spaces, playing games, building things, visiting virtual shops, and even going to concerts with examples like Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, or dare I say it, NFT-based Axie Infinity. Um, a little bit here about Facebook by an Oculus for $2.3 in 2014 because it's a leading sort of platform portal to peek in, part of Facebook's vision for the metaverse. And apparently Facebook's already introduced a virtual work experience called Horizons Workrooms, not where I want to be working anyway. And that's a sort of VR version of Zoom with legless avatars. Legless in the UK means to be very drunk, um, possibly what I am now. And that is what you also need to be to be fully involved in the metaverse. Second life. 
online virtual world introduced in 2003. Second life is an example of social experiences in the metaverse. Although not quite, bear with me, an MMORPG, Second Life remains an open world social network with avatars. The metaverse might resemble a VR version of Second Life. Okay, as promised and definitely alluded to, non-fungible tokens, blockchain-based certificates of authentication for digital objects, which could allow proof of ownership of goods in the metaverse. You may be using real money to not only pay for your rent in the real world, but next you might be having additional rent on your house for your avatar in the virtual world very soon. So finally, that is a bit from me today from Meta AJ Meta 1969. Back to you, hopefully in the real world, in the real studio, Dr. Doug. All right. I've been yelling Nam Shove of Inky for like 10 minutes. So if you don't, you know, for that, uh, that good Neil Stevenson stuff there, if anybody could come up with a Nam Shove of Inky and broadcast it to everyone, it would be Zuckerberg. So I'm, I'm counting on you there, Zuck. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for, uh, wow, that was, that was interesting. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, and finally, in the big world of Voight Comp Tests, I can't compete with Aaron. In the big world of Voight Comp Tests, a Utah company claims they can detect lies by tracking eye movements. You see a tortoise, Leon. It's crawling towards you. Uh, anyway, a, a volunteer track coach was accused of raping a 14-year-old girl and wanted to admit evidence from a company called Eye Detect, actually the, the product called Eye Detect, which, had, uh, which he had passed, this lie detector from this company. The company claims they can exonerate the innocent and identify liars by looking into their eyes. Now, I did a study once with a bunch of loan officers who claimed they could tell whether you were good for it or not by looking in your eyes. They literally said that. And we did this study, and we showed that they had about the same effectiveness as throwing darts at a dartboard. But anyway, the judge in the case admitted the data and ended up with a mistrial. The company's called Converus, and they claim that your eyes will show the truth or lies because you have to think harder to lie than to tell the truth. Now, we all know polygraphs can be beaten, and the science of being able to tell whether someone is lying is still pretty much in the, well, I can tell by looking in your eye there, son. Uh, but polygraphs are about 100 years old, and it's a huge market, but there's very little evidence that they actually work. Polygraphs were banned at work in 1988, after I had to take one, and most states in the U.S. won't accept them in court. I think the point is that they don't seem to have much evidence that this works other than their, you know, your eyes move more if you're lying claim. I haven't studied it, but it definitely sounds dangerous. And that's the news. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for joining us on Security Weekly News. I am telling the truth, really. Look at my eyes. Look. Look at my eyes. 